All right, Braves fans, let's get rolling. Uh, this is State of the Braves. I'm George McNair, and it is awesome to be with you guys. Just love talking Braves baseball with you. And uh, they're playing pretty well right now, 11-3 and three over their last 14 games. The Braves are now 13 and a half games up on the Philadelphia Phillies. So, you know, we're not going to sit here and guarantee that the uh, – that the race for the National League East is over like Mets fans might do, but we will say that we are feeling really good right now being 13 and a half games up. And look, I mean, a good stretch of baseball uh, here in late August, early September uh, would would probably put the um, the National League East away. But of course, what the Braves are really looking to do is maybe finish with the best record uh, in the National League uh, or even the best record, record in baseball, which would have uh, huge benefits for them going into the postseason. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, right now, the Braves are at 83 wins and 44 losses. That's a very impressive record. The Dodgers, however, have been playing tremendous baseball in August. They are at 79 wins. Uh, and Baltimore, across the way in the American League, is at 80 wins. So uh, it is not a guarantee that the Braves are going to finish with the best record in baseball. They have had the best record for quite a while, but they are going to have to play good baseball the rest of the way uh, to lock that best record up. And of course, we know with the new uh, new playoff format, it really does benefit you to be that one seed. Of course, the top two seeds get buys through that first wild card round. Uh, so there's obvious uh, benefit there, but um, we're going to go into uh, how important the best record is in just a second. Uh, before that, I want to just give uh, some very brief Braves news. Ozzie Albies, uh, you know, we've been missing Ozzy here for uh, basically a couple weeks. He is likely to return very soon. Technically, he is already off of the 10-day injured list, but um, Snickers said he's not going to return in the series with the Giants. Uh, the Braves are currently in San Francisco right now. But probably the return for Ozzy would either come in Colorado versus the Rockies or against the Dodgers in that big showdown that's coming up for the Braves at Dodger Stadium. Uh, so, you know, for me, I would love to see Ozzy get a few games in before that Dodger series happens. Maybe he can get rolling again. He was hitting so well uh, when he went on the injured list with that hamstring issue. So, uh, would love to see Ozzy get get back into it against the Rockies. Nicky Lopez has played most of the games at second since Ozzy's been out and has honestly played pretty well, um, as well as you could really expect him to to play. Fawn Grissom getting a couple spot starts. Looks like that's kind of happened against lefties. It's been pretty much a strict platoon going on. But um, but nonetheless, uh, getting Ozzy back and going would be really great to see. So let's get into this best record thing, right? The Braves, again, sitting at 83 wins. The Dodgers at 79 wins. And it's just like the more things change, the more they stay the same. The Braves and Dodgers still the class of the National League. And doing so in a little different ways. You know, the Dodgers have had a ton of injuries this year um, and have overcome them in a lot of ways. I think they've started to pitch much better in August. Uh, where that was kind of a weak spot for them, particularly with some injuries and some some poor play from some of their starters. Uh, but they are really rolling right now, guys. And um, this this series coming up here in about a week is going to be really fun to watch. It's going to be playoff atmosphere in L.A. for sure. You guys know that the Braves have had some struggles actually playing in L.A. over the years. It's not uh, an easy or comfortable place to go and play, especially when those fans are really fired up and certainly they will be with the Braves coming to town. Hopefully the Braves fans will also show up in big numbers in that series. But I think more than any other series that we've seen so far this year, it will feel like playoff baseball in that series. So it's going to be really fun to see, but yeah, the Dodgers are playing the best baseball of pretty much anyone in August. They're 20 and three in August. That is a crazy record. It's kind of similar to the Braves red hot uh, July or sorry, June that they had earlier this season. And, you know, basically what it's done, the Braves have not played poorly uh, since the all-star break, but not quite on that uh, same pace that they were playing before the all-star break. So the Dodgers have definitely uh, taken a couple games or, or at least, you know, made the, the gap a little less 
in, for this, uh, you know, uh, this battle for the best record in baseball. And uh, it's going to be probably a dogfight all the way and see who really values that and uh, who plays the best to get that top spot. So just as a reminder, uh, the top two seeds uh, in each league get a buy in that first round. Uh, you know, now we have the wild card round uh, in which the three seed plays the six seed and the four seed plays the five seed. Um, so getting a buy, getting some rest, getting your, your starters in place exactly how you want them is obvious benefit. And yet, who made it to the World Series uh, in the National League last year? It was the Phillies, a wild card team. So it is obviously not a guarantee that having that buy is going to be the, the primary benefit. Uh, it does help you. And you also get home field advantage, of course, in that series as well. Uh, but you still got to play the games, right? So it matters. How much does it matter? Well, uh, that is up for debate. I think home field and home field advantage does matter a lot still. I think it is important. It may not be as poor, as important as health. And of course, we saw that last year in the 2022 series in which the Phillies beat uh, beat the Braves because primarily Max Fried and Spencer Strider were not fully healthy and weren't quite themselves. So uh, health matters maybe more than anything, and yet it's not the only thing. That's how I would put it. Um, the challenge of, of having to go and play at Dodger Stadium four out of seven games would be a real thing, right? A real challenge. Even in 2021, when the Braves beat the Dodgers in the NLCS, the Braves very fortunately had home field advantage that year. Um, in a quirky way, right? The Braves had only won 88 games. The Dodgers had won 106 games, but the Braves won their division. So they got home field advantage and that mattered a ton for them as they remember walked off those very first two games of the series. You obviously can't walk off a game uh, when you're the visitor. So when you can walk it off and in the game, you know, having that home field advantage and hitting last really does matter. Uh, then the Braves went into the next three games at Dodger Stadium and they only won one of those games, but that still set it up for them to return to Atlanta and finish out the series. So we've seen it in recent past, um, and it really is an important thing. So Dodger Stadium is a tough place to play. It has been for the Braves. Not only is it a tough stadium where you have about 50,000 fans going nuts, but uh, you also have to travel across the country, and that can be a real, a real challenge. Uh, and it has been to the Braves over the last several years. Uh, but on the other side, Truist Park is a really great home field advantage for the Braves. And, you know, the battery gets packed out and Braves fans are, you know, they've embraced this team so much over the last several years. And so, you know, you, you flip it on a positive note as well. Get the Braves to play in Truist Park as much as possible throughout the playoffs. And I think that is a huge, huge benefit to them. 2021 proved that um, and it proved that having that last at bat in big games really does matter. Um, you know, the Braves moving forward, uh, they have the 18th toughest schedule remaining. So it's, uh, they have some tough series coming up. Uh, the Dodgers is obviously a part of that. Uh, the Braves play the Phillies one more time. There's a couple other teams that are vying for um, for the playoffs that the Braves are going to go up against. They play the Cubs uh, near the end of the season. But the 18th toughest schedule obviously is benefiting the Braves some. Now, we've also seen um, some of these teams that you don't expect to be tough can come in and play really tough. And, and the Pirates were one of those. That, you know, they The Braves do play the Pirates again, and yet the Pirates play the Braves as tough as, as anyone has in this second half of the season so far. So, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean all that much, but I think it's worth noting. Uh, the Dodgers, um, in comparison, have the 11th toughest schedule in baseball moving forward. So they have several more series. I think they have two more series against uh, the Giants, who, of course, are fighting for their playoff lives. Um, they have another series against the Diamondbacks, who suddenly are resurgent. And uh, after having a tough run um, in maybe late July, early August have now bounced back and are right there in the thick of things as well for um, a wild card spot. So it will be interesting to see how the Dodgers play against these 
uh, these opponents, especially in the National League West. But of course, this showdown between the Dodgers and Braves, if one of the teams were to sweep the other, it could really flip um, you know, what you're talking about in terms of how close this, this race is for the best record. So, you know, best record's important uh, in this balance between health and momentum. I think Braves fans understand this maybe better than any other fan base because how many years in the 90s and early 2000s uh, were the Braves clearly the best team in the National League? Oftentimes, uh, September was, you know, you weren't fighting for your playoff life. You, you kind of clinched early and then you had two or three weeks of games that in a lot of ways didn't matter. And the Braves, it seemed like, never rolled into the playoffs sharp. Uh, they were always, almost always healthy, right, but never sharp and just ready to go with some momentum. And that's why I really tend to lean towards the idea that, that staying sharp, playing, you know, as, as many meaningful games as, as you can and, and keeping yourself physically and mentally ready to go matters a little bit more. Um then going 100%, it's all about health and being rested. I think baseball is a game that is meant to be played every day. It's meant to be, you know, where you can be physically and mentally sharp and ready to go. And if you're sitting out a bunch of games or you're not playing games in which, as a team, you're taking every game seriously and trying to win that game, um, you can really enter the playoffs not ready, right? It is a stark contrast between a late September game where you've already clinched and you're playing in, you know, you're playing against the Nationals in Washington and there's 10,000 people in the stands and half of them aren't even paying attention to the game. And then suddenly you're in Philly and you've got 45,000 Philly fans screaming at you, right? It's totally different, and that can be a shock to the system. So I think the Braves are in a good place of understanding that a lot better. Uh, I think 2022 is going to be fresh in their minds, and they're going to be certain to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So I think all of this is in the Braves' favor. Uh, and look, if for some reason the Dodgers just played out of their minds and were able to overtake the Braves for the best record moving forward, um, if everything still, if everything else was still in the Braves' favor in terms of staying sharp, they're still playing relatively good baseball going into um, going into the playoffs. I still feel really good about their chances. Um, it's not like if you don't get the best record, you're just dooming yourself. We know that that's not true at all. Um, it just would be nice to to enter an NLCS game. Uh, game one in Atlanta versus in Los Angeles. Of course, the Braves have to get through the NLDS, NLDS first, so you don't want to uh, overlook any really good opponent that the Braves might might play. But man, this team it does make you feel good. Uh, their offense, of course, is historic, and their pitching staff over the last two weeks has really bounced back in a huge way to make you feel more and more confident uh, that the Braves are going to be the class of the National League and hopefully get back to a World Series and hopefully win it. All right, well, one guy who's definitely been resurgent that is worth talking about, and a lot of people are talking about him right now, is Marcel Ozuna. And, you know, it really is impressive uh, just on a baseball level of where he was in early May um, and where he is right now. And just... Watching him right now, it's like it's two totally different, uh, two do totally different hitters. You know, in May he was jumping at the ball, he was out in front of everything. Uh, you know, he's hitting 180 or, or sorry, 080. He was in, hitting 080, rolling over balls. I mean, not hitting balls hard. The the occasional time he would hit it hard, it seemed to be you know hit right at a guy, but it was mostly rollovers to shortstop or third base, and that was it. And, uh, and yet now he's not jumping at the ball. He's staying up the middle. You see in a ton of, ton of hits to right center field, right field. And then when somebody hangs a, you know, a, a curve ball or a change up or, or a slider, he's hitting it over the fence, uh, in left, left center field. It's just a pleasure to watch him swing the bat right now. And look, he, when he's going badly, he is a very frustrating guy to watch, but when he's going well, uh, it is really fun, and he is a streaky player. He always has been, and right now that streak is lasting. I mean, over his last 
month plus, I mean, 30 games, Marcelo Zuna is hitting 349 with a 423 on base percentage and a, an incredible 716 slugging percentage. So he's hitting for average, he's hitting for power, and he is uh, not swinging, he's not swinging at balls, right? He is taking his walks. Uh, last night, he was just one for two, but he took two walks in the Giants game. And he's just looking like he is totally locked in. And hopefully he remains that way uh, all the rest of the way. A Marcelo Zuna in the five hole who's hitting like this behind Olsen is just um, invaluable for the Braves. Olsen hasn't been quite on his tear lately, but you can imagine if Ozuna, Olsen, and Riley are, are all going in the middle of that lineup, how deadly that would be in the playoffs. Marcelo Zuna is basically Lazarus. He's basically back from the dead, right? Um, just remember how close he was to getting, probably getting released. I mean, we, we don't know for sure that the Braves were going to do that, but um, he was so bad at the beginning of the year, uh, you just thought, can the Braves continue to put this guy in the lineup? Um, early May, hitting in the you know, 080s hitting under 100 uh, is is hard to do. He was literally at that point probably the worst player in baseball. And since then, he has just figured it out in a massive way. I think he's maybe had one other, you know, two to three week stretch where he wasn't hitting the ball all that well. But other than that, he's been one of the best hitters in the Braves lineup. And you got to give him credit for that to to be, you know, to be able to come back from that kind of uh, long, bad start to the season is pretty impressive. Now, Ozuna is, is hitting great. You guys might have seen this. This made some news recently. The Mets analyst Jerry Blevins made uh, a comment on Twitter, or I guess we can call it X now, saying that Marcel Ozuna makes a very fun Braves team near impossible to root for. Um, you know, those comments, you guys know, I, I have not been – a Marcel Ozuna apologist. Um, before the season began, I was I was still saying that the Braves should release him based off of uh, his on-field and off-field behavior. Uh, and of course, I was still saying that early in the season when he was hitting terribly. Uh, and again, to Marcel's credit, he turned things around on the field. Um, we don't know if he's turned around things off the field. I certainly hope he has. Um, for for the benefit of himself and his family. Um, but, you know, in terms of this comment from Jerry Blevins, number one, if you don't know who he is, um, he is a former Mets reliever. And so he's coming at it, I guess, from a Mets angle. Um, he also, you know, you're kind of throwing a bomb there on, on Twitter. And I, I don't really care for people who do that. And I don't really care what a Mets reliever or a former Mets reliever thinks about the Braves. He's not following them every day. He probably doesn't fully get the Braves clubhouse, the Braves culture. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really care really what he thinks. But I guess it does make you at least be a little introspective about Ozuna and how we as Braves fans maybe feel about Oz Ozuna. Um, you know, again, I was, I was one of those, um, and there were a lot of them, people who were saying that Ozuna should be gone early in the season. Uh, especially when he was playing so, so poorly. Um, you know, he's still not one of my favorite Braves. You know, it's still in some ways kind of hard to root for Marcelo Zuna. Um, and just because he is playing well doesn't mean that we should ignore uh, his off-the-field issues or what he's done in the past. I don't think that should be the case. Um, but... It is also important to have a better full perspective of Ozuna. Uh, he has certainly been contrite over um, the things that he has done, and he has stayed out of trouble since. Now, does that mean he's, you know, he's glossed over and, and we should gloss over everything that he's done in the past? Again, no. Um, but I think it is fair to look at the positive things that Ozuna has brought to this team this year. And especially when we're analyzing him on the field, um, he's been a really positive um, player for the Braves this year in the clubhouse and, of course, on the field. He's been a good teammate. There's been a lot of stories about how he was instrumental in helping 
Uh, Michael Harris turned things around, at least from a mental perspective. Uh, Matt Olson has talked a lot about how Ozuna has helped him at the plate. And of course, Olson has had a massive year this year. And there's just been a lot of stories about how Ozuna is one of the harder workers uh, in the clubhouse, even though he's just a DH. Um, he, he comes to every early hitting session. Uh, he's never late. Uh, he seems to be a really positive dude on the field uh, and, and in the dugout. So, you know, you, you, should, uh, you shouldn't ignore those things, right? And when he plays well, uh, here's how I take it. Not that you guys should do it the same way, but when he plays well, I have the attitude to cheer for the team and the team's success. Um, and I can be impressed by his turnaround on the field. And, um, and I certainly have been. I'm impressed by Marcelo Zuna and how he's been able to basically, you know, he, it wasn't just this past year too or, or early this season. Basically for two plus years, Marcelo Zuna has been one of the worst players in baseball. He doesn't give you anything um, you know, on the field, obviously, in terms of value, and he wasn't hitting either. So, right. Um, and probably the only reason he was given so many chances was, was because he makes $16 million a year. Um, but again, you, you give him all the credit in the world on the field. Now, in terms of off the field issues and how you should feel about Marcel Ozuna, I'm not going to tell you how to feel about him. Um, but I'll tell you this. I don't know Marcelo Zuna. I don't know his heart. I don't know whether, you know, he is doing things in his life to turn things around off the field, to be a better husband, to be a better person. Um, I was supportive of the Braves releasing him um, when he did these things and to hold him accountable for things that were clearly wrong off the field. Um, but I also don't think we should pretend to be perfect ourselves, right? Uh, that we should necessarily throw stones. Again, that doesn't mean we can't judge things that are wrong and say they're wrong and hold people accountable to those things. And yet, should we never be willing to offer, you know, some level of forgiveness or some level of opportunity for someone to, uh, to better themselves? Again, I was for the Braves releasing him um, just because he's He's bounced back on the field. You know, do I still feel conflicted about him as a Brave? Yes, I do. And yet, I think there's a positive thing for Marcelo Zuna to be in the Braves organization because I think it's a really strong organization built around a lot of high character people. And I think he has benefited from being with the Braves versus maybe with another team that's not as solid with the people that surround him. If Ozuna were to mess up again, would I still support the Braves releasing him, holding him accountable? Um, yes, I do. I, I would. I would support that. And yet, if he really is proving that he's, you know, turning things around off the field, obviously, I hope the Braves continue to support him and, cur and encourage him in that positive direction. In the meantime, he is a part of the Braves and he's playing great. And obviously he's helping the team win. And as a Braves fan, I can be happy for the team while not necessarily buying a Marcelo Zuna jersey, right? You go to the Braves store, they're not selling Marcelo Zuna jerseys. They, He's on the team, right? They're benefiting right now from him being on the team, but they're all also not celebrating him uh, in some kind of obvious ways. So Ozuna is signed through one more season. I very much doubt the Braves, even if he has a good season next year, I very much doubt the Braves will bring him back. But in the meantime, he is a part of the team, and I think his teammates really like the guy. And again, I hope he's turned things around off the field. Um, and I think all of us should at least have a little humility in recognizing that um, – None of us are perfect. We might not have done the things he's done, um, but we can encourage him in, in positive ways while he's around this Braves organization. All right, well, let's move on to another guy who's playing really good baseball right now and a guy who is really solid off the field as well, and that's Charlie Morton. Uh, a lot of people were you know, up in arms over Morton's performance coming off of um, the All-Star break. And over his last three starts, Morton has really bounced back in a huge way. He's, he's now thrown 18 scoreless innings over his last three starts. And his last two starts especially have been 
incredibly encouraging. So that first scoreless start was that weird five-inning start against the Mets in which he also walked, uh, I think it was seven dudes. But his last two starts, he has really figured things out, it seems like, uh, limiting walks, uh, commanding his fastball and curveball, which are obviously his two most important pitches. And he's been very economical, right? Um, his uh, his previous start, 94 pitches. He threw 61 strikes to 33 balls, throws uh, six innings, uh, and again, scoreless start over six innings. And this most recent start from Morton, 109 pitches against the Mets, 67 strikes to 42 balls. Again, throwing throwing strikes, seven innings pitch over that 109 innings. I believe that was a season high in terms of in terms of pitches, but still, you know, getting through seven innings, throwing a lot of strikes and a lot of strikeouts. He struck out 11 guys in that start. And uh, look, the Braves need Charlie Morton, and he's going to pitch meaningful innings in the postseason. He's going to be your number three option um, at the very least through probably the NLDS and NLCS. Um, and, you know, we'll get into Kyle Wright and, and the possibilities there in a little bit. But I think even a, even best case scenario with Kyle Wright coming back, Charlie Morton's still your number three option. Uh, he has, don't forget how much postseason experience he has and postseason success. He is a leader in the clubhouse of this team. And so getting him back on track on the field is super important for the Braves. And he's been doing that. Um, this last start, you know, I'm not going to mention it as much as I did last time, but it was it was a fun broadcast again where you had the four Braves alumni in the booth, um, Jeff Francoeur and the three Hall of Famers, and it was a really fun game. It wasn't quite as magical of a game as when they were in the booth last time, but the Braves win that game 7 to nothing. And, you know, one thing that was mentioned in that um, broadcast was Smoltz analyzing Charlie Morton. And one thing he said that stuck out to me was that, you know, what makes Morton so tough to hit is also what makes him a bit inconsistent. That, um, you know, that kind of interesting, unique arm angle that Morton throws at, it makes his, his um, curveball really elite. But it also makes it really inconsistent from a release point standpoint. When he's got it right, um, it's, in, it's basically unhittable. But, of course, you also will see Morton, especially early in games, bouncing that and bouncing that curveball and being nowhere close. And then the fastball command can be really spotty. Uh, so, again, when you see these last two starts from him, throwing more strikes than balls and being in the zone and around the zone a, a lot more, um, with the fastball, especially in commanding that fastball, it makes that curveball just that much uh, more dominant. So when he's going right, these last two starts are a picture of what he could do in a postseason start to shut down a team. He can be a guy who goes out and throws, you know, double-digit strikeouts, limits, uh, limits contact, and can shut you down. Um, now, when he's bad, um, it can be the opposite of that, right? But but he can also battle through, and even games in which he's not throwing the ball as consistently, um, he can get through five, six innings and keep you in a keep you in a ball game. All right, so another starter to definitely talk about is the guy who just threw last night in the first game against the Giants, and that is Spencer Strider, and he was really, really good again, guys. Strider's scoreless inning streak was snapped at twenty and two thirds innings, but he continues to dominate hitters. Uh, seven innings pitch last night, one earned run, just three hits and nine strikeouts. Um, he his one earned run, you know he uh, he hung a slider to good old buddy Jock Peterson, who hit it into the gap for a triple. Um, you know, then a ground out to allow Peterson to score. That was the only run that Strider allowed. Otherwise, he was incredibly sharp in this game. Just a joy to watch this one. Uh, so that's three straight starts of seven innings pitched from Strider. And that might be the biggest takeaway, that he's going deeper into games, is telling you he has been much more um, effective and efficient with his pitches. So three straight starts of seven innings pitched. Um, all throughout the rest of this season, Strider only has two starts, two other starts of seven innings or more. 
so obviously he has found something and he's been able to carry that over over multiple starts so that's really really encouraging uh, that he hopefully he can do that the rest of the way moving forward and i talked to you guys last time about the fact that if strider can really dominate in the last month plus of the season he could really vie for a cy young and i think he is on pace for that strider obviously uh, is he has dominant peripheral numbers including strikeouts i think he has about 40 more strikeouts than anyone else in the national league or maybe in baseball overall so spencer strider uh, when he is limiting contact and commanding that fastball uh, he is dominant and he was certainly that in this one again just three hits nine strikeouts against the giants more efficient you know he goes seven innings he honestly could have gone probably back out to the eighth inning he was at 94 pitches uh, when he went out of the game, but I think Snicker has a mindset of when he can reducing innings and pitches on his pitchers uh, as we get closer to September and of course October. Another huge bit of Braves news I want to mention as we're talking about uh, their starting pitching is Kyle Wright. Kyle Wright finally was able to make his first rehab start um, and he did so in good fashion. He threw just 26 pitches uh, at Rome, that's the, the Braves um, high A uh, affiliate. Uh, so 26, in, 26 pitches over three scoreless innings in his first rehab start. So this performance is certainly very encouraging. Um, it's awesome that he can go out there and, and pitch three scoreless innings. He struck out four. Uh, but to me, pitch count is really the most important thing to watch. Obviously, we want him to be dominant. We want him to be effective but it's the pitch count that will allow him to get back to the big leagues. I mean, I think 80 pitches is typically the number the Braves look at. That's what they did with Max Freed before they green-lighted him back to the big leagues. And we just don't know. I mean, honestly, um, you know, three to four weeks, I think typically is what a pitcher needs to get back into that 80 range. And that's if they bounce back well after each start. Um, that's what the Braves look at and it's, it's unknown, especially when, you know, we're dealing with a shoulder. We're not dealing with, uh, elbow inflammation that Freed had. So I think the shoulder has proven to be a little more tricky to come back from generally for guys than elbow issues or, or other issues. So Wright's return is still very much in question. If all goes well, right, maybe he could get a couple of starts before the end of the season for the Braves. Now that would benefit the Braves on a couple different levels. You could limit starts for, uh, you know, right for, I'm sorry, for Strider and for, for Morton and for Freed by throwing a right in a couple of these um, series near the end of the year. You get to see what Wright has and if he's maybe ready to make a postseason start. All that being said, right, if he has only pitched maybe two, three, I mean, I think at max, probably three starts going into the playoffs. It's hard to imagine you would then throw him out there in a game in the NLDS. Um, and honestly, you probably don't need a fourth starting pitcher for the NLDS because there are days in between games one and game two and games three and game four. Uh, sorry, games one and game two and games two and game three of the NLDS. There are games between. So you probably only need your top three starters for those games. Uh, so you might be trying to get him ready for the NLCS or the World Series. Uh, in that case, maybe you have him pitching simulated games and tr just trying to get his pitch count up and that sort of thing. Um, we know from the 2021 World Series, weird things can happen. You know, just with Kyle Wright's appearance, with Dylan Lee's <laughs> start um, and Tucker Davidson's start, in the 2021 World Series, sometimes you need a guy that you don't necessarily expect you need, or somebody could go down with an injury, or anything could happen uh, where Kyle Wright could be called upon. So I think that's probably the more likely scenario. Um, he is a an emergency, um, you know, patch if you need one, and hopefully he can get ready and be ready for that. Uh, so he he is important. Obviously, he is a really, really good pitcher that the Braves could utilize. 
but uh, right now it's just a wait and see. But our very first news from Kyle Wright's rehab is positive, so we can be thankful for that. All right, guys, well, the Braves still have two games to go against the Giants here. Again, winning game one, five to one uh, last night. Spencer Strider, again, incredibly sharp. Michael Harris looked awesome. He hit a bomb in the very first inning and um, and I think had three hits on the night, two, two RBIs. Uh, he had another line drive that was caught uh, in which he could have been four for four if that hadn't been caught. So, uh, you know, Harris sometimes just uh, he's he's played great, you know, for about three months now. Uh, but he does have some of these games where he just goes off. And last night was another one of those. Um, all right. So game two uh, is an afternoon game, four o'clock game today. Max Freed is going to go up against Ryan Walker. Walker actually is out of the bullpen. So the. Um, the Giants will be throwing a bullpen game. If you know anything about the Giants, look, I don't know <laughs> about their their manager and and what he does. I mean, this guy is um, quirky to say the least with how he handles his pitching staff. In fact, I think some of his pitchers have come out and been kind of uh, anti um, how he's handled their their pitching staff and bullpen. They basically only have like three real starters, and they pitch a lot of bullpen games. And that's what they will do uh, today. I think the Braves broadcast was mentioning last night that the Giants relievers have the most relief innings to this point in the season as any team since 1906. So he's he is taxing his bullpen in kind of a historic way. And so it will happen again with this bullpen game that they'll go with today against Freed. But I'm focused more on Freed. You know, with his return, he had that great first start against the Cubs. And then he's been a little, I wouldn't say shaky, just inconsistent. And that's really what you would honestly expect from a guy coming back from that. I mean, really consider him still kind of in his spring training for maybe a, a, another start or two. But looking for more consistency from Freed. His last start, he went five and two-thirds innings, gave up three runs, uh, two home runs, uh, nine hits and 103 pitches against the Giants. So he wasn't super sharp. It's pretty odd for him to give up two home runs in a game. And the big thing I remember in that game is how much he was throwing inside um, to the righties and not really balancing uh, going inside and outside. And, um, you know, guys were just kind of inside conscience and 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 pulling the ball. And you had Wilmer Flores pull, pull a fastball down the line and and um, another one of their players, same thing. So hopefully Freed, I don't think it's just about pitch selection like that, but I think it's part of the, the issue and getting back into that mindset, that proper mindset where he can be, we know Freed can hit every corner uh, inside, outside, up, down, um, and he has four elite pitches that he can go to. So I think just seeing him get a little sharper with his pitch command and uh, mixing up his pitch selection will get back to a dominant, dominant freed. So looking forward to watching him today. And then game three for the Braves versus the Giants. The starters have not been announced yet. Um, it could be Elder if they, the Braves want to pitch him on regular rest. If they want to give him an extra day, then it could be maybe Jared Schuster, who the Braves called up, or another spot starter from AAA. So we'll see about that. Uh, but look, guys, the Braves have been going well. Not every hitter is is hitting on, you know, um, 100% right now. You have a little bit of a lull for Matt Olson after he went on that home run tear. It would be great to see him bounce back. Um, and I would also say, you know, that the top of the order has been a little more quiet than usual. Uh, so it would be really awesome uh, to get to get those guys, especially Austin Riley, going at full speed again as well. But it's hard to <laughs> hard to complain too much about this offense. There's always at least two or three guys who are really hot and tend to carry the team enough to, to win the game, especially when the starters have been going so well over the last two weeks. So hopefully, again, we'll get a good start from Freed and whoever starts in that third game and move on to Colorado. And uh, all of this will set up again for the showdown of showdowns with the Dodgers here in about a week. All right, guys. Well, it's been great to talk some Braves baseball, and I will talk to you soon.